Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to the uh, Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan, FCCJ. Hi, my name is Fuku Nagamasaki of the uh, seventh vice president, today's moderator. Um, please ask your uh, cooperation to bring uh, for one now short uh, press conference. But it will be a very important issue and a very distinguished person who came to the club. Uh, may I introduce uh, the UN reporter, uh, Anand Grover, I will be called to Anand, uh, who has been a re reporter for since uh, 2008, and especially he's uh, reporting that on uh, health issues. And once, 2012, uh, November, he came to Japan and surveyed about the uh, details of the Fukushima disaster health conditions. This time, uh, he will be finished already, or mostly finished his report. Uh, maybe you can find a distributed uh, draft or a complete report in English. And uh, he met uh, local people and NGOs and local government people, so on and so on. And today, that he will bring uh, here uh, his findings and most uh, important issues that the Japanese government uh, challenge about uh, this health issue in Fukushima. May I introduce Mr. Uh, sorry, uh, Arand Gruber. Uh, Arand, please. Thank you very much, uh, Masaki. I'm very happy to be back in Japan, uh, particularly because the chair also happens to know Hindi very well. <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised to learn that uh, the, the, the chair actually uh, has learned uh, uh, Hindi in Benares, um, which is, as you know, India is in the throes of election right now, and the humdrum of elections has taken over. So it's, it's good to get out and see things from uh, afar. Now, coming back to the issue of uh, the Fukushima disaster, uh, I already presented the report to the Human Rights Council in May of uh, 2013, uh, and there are important recommendations uh, which I want to highlight. But I just want to begin with uh, the, the right to health framework, which I think most of you know. Uh, and uh, the Japanese uh, state, the government, has signed on to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, which has an obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to health, um, uh, which is in, contained in um, Article 12 and elaborated in general comment. Uh, the most important part, as far as I am concerned, uh, in terms of the Japanese situation, which I highlighted in the report, which I feel there's a challenge for the Japanese society, is the issue of participation of the communities in deciding the responses to any disaster, and particularly Fukushima, and the notion of participation, which entails uh, following General Comment 14, which is the elaboration of Article 12 of the uh, right to health. Um, when I was uh, discussing with government, and I must say the government uh, paid very serious note to the report and the recommendations, and they, they actually gave me a very serious response which shows the maturity of the Japanese uh, uh, government to this issue. Of course, there are differences in approaches. And one of the differences I, I, I would contend is the fact that the notion of participation has not sunk in in, uh, in, uh, in the response. And uh, I was told by the Japanese government quite often that we have a, a democratically elected system of uh, representatives. but. I must emphasize that the, 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 the notion of participation goes beyond the elected representatives. And it involves the communities who are directly affected or may be affected. And it involves their being involved in the decision making in the response. Now, I find that in large number of uh, societies, people give me this kind of response. And they, they've not imbibed, I think, generally, the notion of participation, which is from bottom up. And especially in responses to disasters, if you don't have that, 
than, than there are flaws, and which was evident in terms of uh, uh, citing people, rehabilitating people, without taking their choices into consideration, and particularly women and persons with disabilities. This was really a serious issue. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the other issue, which I, I feel was very important, uh, and as highlighted in the report, is the independence of the regulatory system. Uh, and that was one of the flaws prior to the disaster, which became manifest later on. Uh, but the questions on that still linger on, and I think that has to be addressed. Now, what the main recommendations which were actually uh, put forth in the report was firstly about information being disseminated. Uh, the right to health requires that information be made available, uh, and therefore also prophylactic measures being made available. Uh, as we know that iodine prophylaxis was wanting, uh, and that was an issue which could, uh, which could have really saved a lot of uh, uh, problems. Uh, there was uh, a distinct understanding on the part of the government that this issue has to be uh, responded to more effectively. But what are the systems that have been put in place now in terms of information which should be made available is a question mark for so far as the recommendations are concerned. Um, the second issue was, and this is a, a generic issue, and this is where uh, there's a, a dispute between me and not only the government, but also some international agencies, and there's a legitimate dispute. I will not, for one, even suggest that I'm right on that, and that is the notion of what is the adverse health impacts because of low-dose radiation. This is a very, very important issue. And frankly, as far as I am concerned, the jury is out. We don't know. Uh, the Japanese authorities took the view that what happened in Chernobyl is a, a very clear indication about, as to what can happen. So therefore, they concentrated only on thyroid cancer in children, whereas data, data from the atomic bombs in Hiroshima, long-term studies show very clearly that there is no low threshold for cancers to occur in the long term. So if that is the situation, if the scientific community is also not 100% unanimous on this, and there is clear indication that there is no low, low threshold limit at all, one has to err on the side of caution and then do health surveys which are long term and take into account not the narrow appreciation of what happened in Chernobyl, but actually see what could happen which, which, are, uh, which are likely. And this is where the major differences occur. Um, this, flowing from that, uh, the whole notion of what is the threshold in terms of radiation, uh, the, the notion that the Japanese government has actually suggested that between 1 and 20 millisieverts is actually safe is an issue which has to be uh, thrashed out. There's a disagreement on that between me and the Japanese government because we do not know the effects of low-dose radiation and there is, as I said, evidence on that. So we cannot ignore that. And that also falls into the issue of whether you rehabilitate, whether you actually ask people to evacuate, which have been issues that uh, people have been talking about. The flowing from that, uh, because they say that there is no uh, manifest evidence between low-dose radiation and health, adverse health effects, the scope of the health surveys have been limited. But unfortunately or fortunately, evidence is building up, as I would suggest. that, uh, And this is what I got just now from uh, some of the people, that in the last uh, three years, we've had at least 75% percent persons with malignancies. And the data is that 2011, it showed up in 15. They're all children, because they have been monitored. In 2012, it was 50. 2013, it was 10, making a total of 75. Uh, and uh, uh, out of them, we have, from the data available from the government, 28 boys and 47 girls. 32 were papillary, uh, one was benign, one was indeterminate, and the rest are under observation. 
So you have clear indication of malignancies and they were operated uh, from that. So it's not that uh, we were flying kites as it were. There is definite evidence of that kind of thing happening. And it's an admitted position by the gov government that most of these people were suffered exposure from low dose radiation. Um, I have made my comments on the, the type of surveys that have been carried out, and I think it should be more comprehensive and uh, more elaborate. Uh, that, that, in, that is an issue which the government has to look into. The, the other point is, what is your plan to reduce the level of radiation in the areas to one millisievert? Now, there's no clear-cut plan on that. And that's an issue that I've raised, which I think has to be answered. Um, the, the, the government uh, based their finding on a letter of the ICRP, which said that it is not unsafe to have a dose limit or a, a range from 1 to 20 millisievert, which in fact is contrary to the Japanese law, contrary to what has been agreed to even in Ukraine, that issue has still not been answered as far as I'm concerned. Um, one of the uh, other issues which I just want to highlight is the decontamination plan. Uh, you, obviously, the topsoil has to be removed. There have been uh, challenges on how do you remove them, uh, where do you put them, and ultimately, that topsoil, where is it going to be relocated? There's no clear-cut understanding on that. Um, I think um, one of the major things is I'm happy that the government did involve the, the, the people in, in, the, in the procedures of decontamination, but sometimes people have actually mentioned that there was no proper information about what, uh, what was the dosage level, how they would be actually removing the topsoil, what was the proper equipment, etc. And there are issues relating to in play schools and children's schools where the decontaminated soil is just removed to one part of the playground without marking them. I've seen that personally. There are also issues of radiation monitoring stations which capture only the radiation dose at a particular site, but it'd be completely different from the dosage which would be available and detected even 10 yards from there. So that's an issue which actually a lot of people have been talking about. Um, finally, I think the, uh, you know, the accountability of, the, of TEPCO is still an issue which has to be resolved. The government has you know, taken over the equity, etc. But who is going to be liable at the end of the day? And I feel that because of government taking, taking over equity, the burden should not shift on the taxpayers. How is TEPCO being, going to be made liable? So these are the issues that I had raised in the, in the recommendations. And I felt that I will just highlight them today. But I would welcome questions from the floor. I've taken only 15 minutes because I want more questions. And uh, uh, last time I took a bit long. And I, I was warned by uh, my translators that um, you know, when, I, when uh, uh, people speak in uh, English and it has to be translated into Japanese, you have to leave uh, 1.5 times the amount uh, of time. So I'd be very happy to take questions. Um, for me, this is an on ongoing dialogue process with the government. I know the government is very serious about this issue. There are differences between the view I have taken in the government. But that, I said, is a legitimate view. But I think it's important to highlight these issues so the dialogue can continue. And I want to see that communities and civil societies are proactively active on this issue and can actually make a difference with the government's responses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have to introduce uh, uh, two interpreters. Sorry that I forgot. Uh, Ms. Ma uh, Mary Joyce and uh, Tom Eskil Darson. Uh, thank you very much today's work, hard work. Then we will be proceed uh, Q&A session. And firstly, to uh, invite from uh, working press table, and please identify your name and uh, short questions, please. Uh, 
Patrick Zollnoy, Zürcher Zeitung from Switzerland. Um, there's not just the Japanese government in this issue, there's also the UN system. Uh, you're part of the human rights arm of the UN system. How do you assess the work of the UN system as a general? We have the IAEA, which promotes nuclear power and assures safety. If that's possible, that's another matter. We have the WHO, who many say listens too much to the IAEA. So in the end, does the UN do uh, what they're supposed to do? Should I answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I'm not part of the UN system, first of all. I'm not an employee of the UN. It's a pro bono job. And I'm as critical of the UN as I'm critical of other things. It's irrelevant uh, who says what. But you have a legitimate point in saying that uh, and there's a, as a, there's a growing feeling that the UN system has been not responding as it should. In fact, in my report, I have actually criticized not only uh, the ICRP, but also others who have taken the view that during the disaster and post-disaster, you can have radiation doses which are uh, level much higher than what is considered to be safe. If your own legal system says that 1.3 millisievert is safe. How can you raise it at 220? And how can the UN system endorse it? These are very legitimate points of view. But I believe that every entity, whether it's a state or the UN, is like a democratic space. Don't expect the UN to be a monolith. You know, I agreed to be a UN Special Rapporteur because the UN Special Rapporteur has a right to speak independently and be critical of everything. And I have been critical openly of the, of the UN uh, policies on some issues because if they're, I consider them to be incorrect, I reserve the right to constructively criticize that in a respectful manner. And uh, therefore, and as far as the, the reporters are concerned, they are not only independent, they are not employees. We are doing this job pro bono. I have to do this during my <laughs> free time uh, when I'm not lawyering in India or working for my uh, NGO, which is the Lawyers Collective on issues relating to health, etc. Um, you'll have to ask the UN, actually. You should ask this question to the official bodies of the UN as to what they have to say about these things. But I think as far as I'm concerned, uh, this I have talked to the, the people within ONSCIAR as well as um, you know other groups. And uh, to be very honest, privately they agreed with my report. But officially they may take positions. And if they take positions which are different from mine, I'll be definitely be critical of them in open forums like the Human Rights Council. So for me, whether it's the UN or the Indian government or the Japanese government, they are democratic spaces where you can clearly articulate the point of view you hold. Um, I'm Martin Fackler with the New York Times. Mr. Grover, welcome to Tokyo. Um, this, you correctly pointed out this issue of health as being so central to our understanding of what's going on up in Fukushima. And you mentioned the evidence is building up. And this, of course, is a crucial question is, uh, two questions really. One is the causal relationship between the accident and what we are observing. And second off, is there actually an increase in these cases? Because you, also, you hear the counter argument that we're seeing more of these cases because we're measuring them. And I wonder if you could maybe dive a bit deeper into what you've seen. You've taken a good look at this um, from an independent position. Uh, is there cause for concern? You know, what is the evidence that you've seen building up? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. That, that, I think that's the most important question. And nobody can say whether it's going down or up. And that's the problem. You know, it's, uh, and I will not blame the Japanese government to take, to, for taking the view they're taking. It's a legitimate, possible view. But what I say is the two issues. One is, what is the evidence available from Chernobyl or uh, Three Mile Long Island uh, data? The data is not clear, especially from Chernobyl, which is something which is very, which should have been the basis of evidence. The data was not available there. 
it was not available at all publicly for a very long period of time so what came out later was a very narrow understanding of what happened there so if you just base yourself on chernobyl and the limited understanding of that you may go wrong so what i'm saying is we cannot rely only on chernobyl you have a new situation every situation is so generous it's new on its own please err on the side of caution you know and japan has been if i may use the term victim i don't like the, i would say survivor you know survivors are more positive and japanese have been survivors of the atomic bomb in hiroshima and nagasaki they they've gone through a huge amount of not only indignity but health adverse effects and they have the issue at heart for them it's it's a very important and a sensitive issue so why do we narrow our understanding of uh, fukushima to the chernobyl very parochial understanding if i may call it let's err on the side of caution and look at things which are may come up and this is not basis based only on conjecture at this stage if i would just say this it would not be appropriate but we have data which is independent from hiroshima and nagasaki japanese theoretical studies particularly osaza and all which stay definitely and i have that here what does it say i wanted to this is osaza's paper of studies of mortality of atomic bomb survivors 1950 to 2003 so they have studied the data long term what is happening what does it say i'm just reading one sentence sentence out the estimated lowest dose range with a significant err for all solid cancer was 0 to 0.20 that means there is no low threshold limit a formal dose threshold analysis indicated no threshold is zero the starting point moment you go up solid state cancers increase over a long period of time that's what it says i'm not just saying okay you know chernobyl was limited therefore let's expand it we have data which is scientific which is saying that so that's why i say let's have more why do you want to reduce it only to thyroid why don't we have urine analysis why don't we have blood analysis etc apart from the fact that if young mothers and their children feel that you know that they need a second opinion why should they not get it and you know what i am worried about is japan is a very developed economy has response systems which are much much better and that's an asset than most parts of the world and i i'm just comparing my my own country which is now going on a nuclear expansion you know civilian nuclear expansion for energy what will happen there i dread to think at the same time i also uh, note the fact that over a period of time it may be that nuclear plants become more and more you know reliable stable but that's in the future it's also speculative so all i'm saying is err on the side of caution we don't know thank you yes please oh, we don't have a roving mic this is very bad technology <laughs> all the sound technology is from japan and it's not happening <laughs> Eric Slaven with Stars and Stripes. Regarding the low-level radiation that you've talked about, uh, when you spoke with Japanese government officials, um, what were the reasons they were giving for, I guess, resisting some of the arguments that you're making? And if your opinion differs from what those reasons really are, uh, please uh, enlighten us on that. Well, you know, if you want the Japanese government, as it is very. um you know it's it, it gave a very detailed response which i really welcome i actually welcome criticism because in in my opinion criticism is the most important tool in trying to sort out issues i don't take it personally at all if a if a scientific uh, person or a person who has a, a considered view criticizes my report i actually welcome it that's my it's in the heart of my blood you know Uh, if that phrase is accurate i don't know whether you can have a heart in the blood but you know the core of my thinking 
as a lawyer, I think like that. As and I'm I really I'm, I was so happy to see such detailed comments. It's available on the website of the the Human Rights Council. It shows they have really put a lot of effort to counter my view, which is legitimate. Basically, as I said, it's a narrow appreciation, and they think the risks are not as I. I'm not saying the risks are high. I'm saying it's unknown. So they think it's uh, it's uh, you know in. If I if I'm being unfair, please point it out. But I'm, I think they think that the risks are not as much as as I would make them out to be. Though I'm not making them out to be in that sense. And there is another thing. Uh, there's a difference in in approach, which is also true across the world. There is what is called the public health approach, which is a maximum number of people should actually be catered for. So if there are one or two people who die. It doesn't matter. In the sense, take an example, and I'm not being deleterious. Take an example of forget nuclear uh, power plants. Just talk about automobiles. Automobiles come on the road. They produce uh, carbon monoxide, this, that, the other, carcinogens. Some people are going to fall ill. They are going to die. Okay. What is the public health? What is the advantage? People are traveling fast. I came last night at midnight. I got onto the plane at Delhi, and I'm in Tokyo. I'm talking to you. Big advantage, right? But gases will mean people will die. That is an acceptable risk in development. The human rights approach says no. If a person dies, it's not acceptable. There's a difference in approach. But can you say no? We won't have development. It's a big issue. But there's a difference in approach. Please. Uh, Mr. Grover, uh, my name is Hiroi Kujita. I'm a journalist with the Kukumin Shimbun. I'm not a scientist. I think you're wrong, and I'd like to hear your opinion about my, some of the points I mentioned. First, um, recent correlation between uh, cancer and the radiation started with the fruit fry experiment. Drosophila molenogasters. And it was an experiment of the high dose radiation. However, we extended the you know, power line to uh, zero point. But there is no data to back up the low dose effects. In fact, there are people who say low dose radiation is good for health even. Second, um, in Fukushima, what happened in Fukushima is that a lot of people evacuated. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the latest data, but uh, over 2,600 people, maybe over 27 by now, uh, died because they, you know, after they evacuated. Maybe that's their life span. Okay? But uh, I talked with the local, uh, uh, well, the uh, mayors and the governors, and they said perhaps the main cause was not the radiation, but the fact that they were they couldn't uh, get the medical treatment necessary, or medication necessary, or certain kind of treatment necessary because of evacuation. They had to go to uh, you know uh, refugee center or whatever, right? So from the viewpoint of the human rights, there's one concept which is very wrong. This is, is scientific. One? This is scientific concept. There is one? There's one. This is my enemy. That is arara. Arara. OK? In Japanese, it sounds very strange, arara. But it, it stand, uh, stand for as low as reasonably achievable. In other words, the radiation, lower the radiation, the better. Okay, but because of that concept, lower the better, zero the better. You know, people were evacuated, and they died because of, not because of radiation, but because of evacuation. Mm. This is inhumane, and the Japanese people are so ignorant, in conscientious. Many people being killed, in fact, not because of radiation, because of evacuation. And the concept is, alala, the low or the radiation, the better. Question? The question is, I like, asked the question. What, uh, ask the question already. 
I would like to hear your opinion about my points I mentioned. That was my question. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for you know, making that point. I hope you're right. But you know, you're, you're, you're emphatically um, making out that you are right. I don't say that I'm 100% right. And I think scientific temper doesn't, it's not ideological. Scientific temper always raises questions. And I think for you to raise a question like this is very legitimate. But you know, uh, I, I don't want to get into the dispute about the actual causes of those deaths. It could be evacuation, it could be bad treatment. What is necessary is the long-term studies. Those studies are not going to be manifesting in whatever cancers now. They'll come. And you see that happening up to 20, you see Osaza's paper is 2005 to 2000, uh, sorry, 1950 to 2030. 50 years on, we are getting data. This is a long-term thing. It can't be done now. There are viewpoints. Low dose is good. I mean, a lot of people go and do sunbathing. They think it's good. We don't know. A lot of people also say in Australia, cancer is caused. Scientific studies do not rule out the possibility. I'm not going on what you are saying, what I say. We go by validated papers. Validated papers as late as 2000. Uh, this is published in 2012. As late as 2012. Don't support what you are saying. So I'm, I'm saying if sci the scientific community is raising this question, the government cannot ignore it. Neither the government nor I are experts. I'm, I happen to be a biochemist. I did a lot of work on protein synthesis when I was a biochemist. So I know the issues. But I cannot give an opinion. Scientific community is divided. I'm not talking about the UN community. The UN community may say anything. The scientific community is not saying that it's, it can be ruled out. So that's why I base my report on that. I cannot based on my ideological precepts. I may be in favor of a nuclear plant. I may not be in favor of a nuclear plant. But I will go on a scientific basis, which is not clear on this. And therefore, I say err on the side of caution. And it may be that the Japanese government is right. If it is, please involve the, the communities who are affected. So when people are being moved out or moved in, why did you consult them? Consult them so they can actually tell you. I don't want a house if I'm a person uh, with handicap. I'm a person with disability. A lot of people were moved into houses which were completely unsuitable because you don't involve the communities. So there are a number of issues like that which also have to be addressed. But thank you for <laughs> being critical about it. Yes, yes, please. Uh, my name is Ian Thomas Ash, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and a member at this club. Uh, I think the mothers uh, that I have met in Fukushima would uh, thank you for your comments and just say, let's err on the side of caution because you don't wait until people are sick to, until you protect them. You first protect them and then you figure out what's happening. And as you said, the data in Chernobyl is still out. Um, on a practical level, what would you say? So I think the mothers would be very happy to say yes. So here's somebody very important who's saying, let's err on the side of caution. But on a practical level, what would be some of your advice? How can you, what can you offer to help the children, to help protect them now? Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I don't think I'm that important. I just have a position. And uh, because of that, I can articulate a point of view. I, th I think there's a lot of issues that mothers have. First of all, you know, uh, when uh, the mothers found there were nodules in the first year, they were not allowed secondary examination by uh, alternative doctors, which is a wrong thing to do. I think government has, you know, re realized that. The other thing is that because of the, the disaster, and it's nothing to do with only the nuclear disaster. There are problems of families being separated. It's, it's a natural consequence. And you know, it's a very difficult thing for families to be separated because, okay, where is a job available? The, the male person will stay in the affected area. That's where the job is. The women will move out and with the children. There are separation of young families. The government also has to sort out how this happens. But you know, information being made available, treating mental uh, issues with sensitivity 
is a very important response package. And I, I, I think the government is trying, but it's because participation is not a very nodal way of working in all states, because they don't think, what does it matter? I mean, you know the answers, you know? And that's a problem. We don't know the answers. Not only, I'm talking about scientific, when you resolve an issue, when you respond, the responses are best when everybody who's, in, who's actually affected is involved in the decision-making process, in the implementation and monitoring. I'll give you a very simple example from my own country, and I do a lot of work on HIV. You know, we, were, we are fortunate we have generic companies, but we couldn't roll out an HIV program till 2004, though it was available since 1997. But every time there are problems of outages, stock out, this. So I propose to the government that you should involve the people who are living with HIV in your response and in designing the program. They first scoffed at it. Today, because they have been involved every time when there's a stock out, the, the people living with HIV group in a remote part of India send a mobile message. This is a status, this is a status. And they're able to use that system and to correct it, you know? It's so effective because of that. But the, oh, I'm a decision maker, I won't, I won't have. People, who are they? They don't know anything. That kind of attitude prevails all over the world within the state, but now people have realized the benefits of it. And I want here also to, for the government to realize the benefits of it. And if they are right, they can convince the people. You know, you in every disaster, whether it's a political, economic, environmental disaster, you have to win the hearts of the people. And it can be done everywhere. It will be done here also. I'm very confident. Over a period of time, the fact that the communities are coming out and saying this, government is listening. It's not that they're not listening. They are sensitive. And nobody wants a disaster on their ends. And political fallout also can be bad. So I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. Next question. Yes. I wonder if I could ask a follow-up question. You mentioned an inadequate, I think when you were talking about the, um, the health screening, you mentioned they had thyroid cancer screening, but they needed other screening. Well, yeah, like, you know, they, uh, they, they can be blood and urine analysis, which can be done, because CCM and strontium, all those things have to be looked at. And it's limited in the sense even in terms of information surveys, who was at that time at a particular area. It's not the people who are generally affected because the fallout was beyond Fukushima also. So the numbers, the actual affected areas, and not limiting only to thyroid cancer for children, there are other tests you can do. I think the government has realized that, and I think they are willing to look into it. That's what I understand. I, I, this time I'm not able to meet the government because it's not a formal mission, but you know, I'm privately talking to people so that I can have some. I'm not such an important person as that gentleman made out to me. I'm just a rapporteur. But in the UN system, it has some import. So. And the other question is, you mentioned uh, the need for more information. Is there information that's not being given out about radiation? No, I, I, do, I wonder if you could elaborate on no, that. No, 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 no. I, I meant that in the future, if there is... Because in this case, we know that speedy data was not made available. So what are the systems going to be put in place tomorrow? We need to know that. It should be made, it should be clear, and it can be done. The government is now much wiser that we did not release the speedy information in time, which led to what you were saying, maybe the evacuation was done wrongly. But if everybody has the data, you know, if you don't give data in a critical juncture, people go on rumors. Whether it's a, you know, a riot or an environmental disaster, and you can't allow that to happen. So what are the systems that are going to be put in place to make sure that data is available immediately? This is not atomic secrets or a war. It's human beings uh, you know, who are affected by a disaster. And disasters can happen. They're not going to be. You know, from now onwards, you can't say there won't even be any disasters. Nobody even expected a tsunami. Tsunamis came in our, after a period of time. So if disasters are going to happen, what is the system to be put in place, which everybody knows about? You know, in, in, the, in Futaba, where uh, the, the plant was located, no 
nobody was given information at the time of siting the plant about what we are going to do in, in the case of a disaster. The mayor of Futaba has been going all around the world. He says, I feel like a fool, you know, that I was sort of told everything is okay. That should not happen again. If you have a plant, whatever, you, I can't tell the, the Japanese government, don't have this. That's their choice, the choice of the Japanese people and the government. Whatever system you put in place, it must make information available and the system should be put in advance to the knowledge of everybody. That's very, very important. And I think the Japanese government has the capacity technologically, etc., etc., to put such a system in place for others to follow. It's a challenge for them. They can be leaders in this field, you know. And that, that, I think that'd be a great thing if they can put that system in place. And you involve the community, okay, this is what's happening here. It may not be on a nuclear plant. It can be, it can be on any issue. How are we going to involve the communities in response to it? It's a big challenge, and I tell you, the if you're able to do it, it's a big result and a spin-off. Any other questions from working press? Then the, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> New York Times okay. is very, that's good. No, these are, these are no, 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 these are important issues. I, I hope no it's issues. okay. You mentioned also the evidence is building up, and I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Do you feel there's evidence no, I, of I, I, health no, issues, or that, uh, you the explain fact, that comment? No, I only got to know in the morning that there are 75 cancers detected, and 32 were operated for surgery. So there is already evidence that even according to the government, if it is low dose threshold, uh, low dose uh, radiation, sorry, then cancers have occurred already. But this is only three years down the line. What is going to happen after 50 years? We don't know. So I think the evidence is there of some sort, but we, I cannot predicate because I'm not an expert to decide. This has to be studied. What are the reports that are made available? We'll have to look at that. And this is the data which will be coming over a period of time, and we have to analyze it. I mean, it's great if it doesn't happen to be a bad scenario. If the Japanese government is right, it's very good. But I don't know. I'm not able to convincingly agree to their point of view, to be very honest. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from working press? The, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Patrick Solnoy, Zürcher Zeitung from Switzerland again. Um, you said, uh, as somebody thinking in human rights terms, you cannot weight people's life against costs. But uh, money is finite, also in the Japanese health system, although it has probably more money than other countries. Um, so at some point, you have sort of a trade on how much screening you want to do in Fukushima, around Fukushima, and you have to take this money somewhere out of the health system. Isn't that a concern of you that some other uh, health is. issues could then fall under the table? No, no, it is. That's why community participation is critical because every country, Jap Japan is fortunate to have the wealth and the systems it has, but even their resources are limited. You cannot just spend endlessly on anything. So how do you decide that issue? If you have the community with you in the decision making, it's easy to decide. If I am going to be a sacrificial goat, I should be part of the decision-making process. That's why we have it. Not only because it's effective, but when critical choices have to be made, it can't be only the elected representatives who, in my country, can tell you, after the election, they don't care. I don't think in any country they care. They were elected, why should they bother? That's when it becomes critical for the people to say, Okay, we are also interested in this. Let us decide together. And you build a confidence. Even if you take a wrong decision, the community is with you. The value of community participation, according to me, is so critical. And more I think of in any country, I realize that this is the most critical developmental governance issue which confronts all states. Because every case, resources are limited. You have to make critical choices. And you cannot decide on other people's behalf. We will do this. Because they haven't voted for that particular project. And it's important for them to be part of the decision-making process. The governments gain confidence of the communities, even if it's a wrong decision. 
because they are part of the decision making process. I think if I can get that idea across to a lot of great governments, I'll have done my job as a as a you know uh, rapporteur because this is I have seen as the most critical element in the what is called the right to health approach. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh yeah, again. Am I yeah, yeah. Am I yes. not answering your questions or? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's very interesting. Oh. <laughs> sorry, I, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to hog no, no, it. No, no, no problem. Um, it's good that you were dialoguing. You, you mentioned your different viewpoint about the significance of these thyroid uh, cancers with the Japanese government. Is there something that the Japanese government should be doing, in your view, that they're not doing as a result no, of their no, different assessments? I can't assessment say that because I've just got this data. I will not be able to, you know, uh, make a, a comment on this. I'm just saying there is evidence to show there is cancer. But we need to study for a long time. I cannot comment on this to say this way or that way. It would not be fair. But should they be doing something preventative? I just wonder if there's like a, like, uh, is there something they should be doing as a result of this? No, I, what I've said already in the report that it should be much broader, the coverage of the health ailments that should look at and tests they should do. So that we don't miss out. That's all. Good, at least I'm eliciting a good response. <laughs> uh, Fujita, again. My question is, isn't it irrational to fear something unknown damage and kill over 2,600 people in exchange? We, we, you know, we use, use fire, which is dangerous. We smoke which may be bad for the health. And we, we, me, okay, I don't smoke either. I occasionally this smoke. This is quite <laughs> but, but we drive. You know, the rate of accidents is high. So isn't it irrational to treat, you know, nuclear is something different? No, 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 no. You see, that's why it's very important. This is what I want to make very clear. In terms of tobacco, what is the new thinking after the framework convention on tobacco control? Nobody tells you and me, don't smoke in that sense. You're free to smoke. It's not like the war on drugs. Though tobacco is worse than cannabis. It's worse than morphine in terms of, morphine has pain killing capacity. Tobacco has no virtue. But nobody is prohibited from smoking tobacco. It's unlike the war on drugs, which is an ideological streak of certain governments, which I've written about, I don't need to repeat, and it's a complete failure. That's why we are going back on it. And most importantly, the US started going back on it. You know, look at the damage it did for so many years to so many people. In my country, people smoked, they ate, they drank cannabis on holidays. That was a culture. And we didn't have addiction like that. But following the war on drugs, we have had so many people addicted to it. No, so no, one minute, one minute. So smoking is a, the way we approach smoking is different, flowing from actually Mayor Bloomberg's notion. We will tell you it's bad. Okay, so information is very important because your autonomy is being protected. I get information, I decide. Similarly, it's the participation model. You give information to people, they take the decision. That's why I say, even if they take the wrong decision, they are participants. It's not I deciding for you and making a killing out of it because of the money I make on it as a politician. And they have no role in that thing, but they are the victims of that disaster. If I'm going to be a victim of the disaster, I should have a decision-making role in the thing. So the thinking in human rights term is, it is information and it is consent on information. That is the rub of the matter. So politics has to be seen in now onwards, maybe in the last decade or so, in human rights terms, that people decide on information made available. It's not elected representatives who just decide once in five years to be elected, and then all the decisions are taken without the participation of the people. That kind of democracy, according to me, is past. The new type of democracy is going to be on issues 
where people are consulted regularly over a period of time within the interregnum of the election process, like it's happening in India now. We are not ready to accept that every five years. We want every time when you take a major decision, we should be consulted. We may decide incorrectly, but the people's power, people's decision making should be the central point. Thank you. Any other question? Oh, yes. Swiss TV, my name is Thomas Stalder. I do have a question about the costs. Um, oh. Who sh costs? Who should pay that in the end? Because it's the society, it's the cost of the society, or do we also have costs, for example, for the operator or for the builder of the nuclear power station in this case? Well, that's the issue I've raised in the, in the report. Who's going to be paying the cost at the end of the day? It should be TEPCO. They should be doing it. And it should be the regulator because they were looking the other way for whatever reasons. And it should not be the taxpayer. The tax base should not be footing the bill. But that's a challenge which has to be worked out. Right now, it's an interregnum measure, and how it works out in the end and pans out the end in the end would be determinative. I would hate to see that the taxpayers pay the money for the lives saved or treated, and TAPCO goes off scot free. Is there any other questions from working press? Then open to the other people other than working press. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Please speak in Japanese. Uh Yanagihara え、福島の子供たちを安全な場所で避難させてほしいということを求めて裁判を起こした原告の弁護団の子供たちを避難させる義務はないと判断しました。で、これは子供たちはあたかも交通事故で車に引かれても自分で張って病院に行けというような自己責任を課したものだと思っています。え、この子供たちに自己責任を課すこと、え、ことについてどのように思われますかこれが一つ目の質問です。で、もう一つ目は、え、最近の福島県の発表では、え、子供の甲状腺癌はえ、ベラルーシの3年間の子供たちの患者の数に比べて、え、人口の比率も考えます
as one of the principles of human rights is that if I make a comment uh, on a new data, which is 47 cases, I would ask the government its response first. That's only proper. So I don't want to make comments either way because I have not studied it properly about the number of cases, whether it indicates this way definitely or not. Because this will be subject to analysis, whether they are actually relatable, not relatable. All these things have to be gone into. But it cannot be ignored. This is what I've been saying from the beginning. Uh, and we cannot sit on a, you know, quietly and say everything is hunky-dory. It's, it's not so simple. Let's look at it critically with all different points of view and in the spirit of science, which is actually critical thought, having different points of view on it. And uh, that's the way to look at it. So I will not comment on new facts where the governments have not been noticed and the response not elicited. It's not proper for me to do that. That's the protocol that as special reporters we have to follow. And I'm very particular about it. And I say anything about it uh, which may be either way toward favorable or unfavorable to the government, it would be very unfair to the government. And I won't do that. Thank you. Maybe your next one is uh, uh, our final question. Yes. And any question? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. え、日本の市民活動に身を投じて一生懸命自分なりに声を上げてきました。世界に対して親の責任として、できることは何だとお考えでしょうか。Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you are active on this issue. And my hope would be that uh, you know, the government take your point of view seriously as a legitimate point of view. Um, it always takes time and uh, we don't have time on our hands. Um, it will be my endeavor to bring it to the notice of the government through whichever means that, you know, whoever, parents, children, rights activists, persons with disability, their point of view actually does got, get uh, uh, across to the government and they are taken into confidence in decision-making processes. That's the way I look at it. In terms of principles or otherwise, um, you know, preventive principle or otherwise. So I'm happy that you're working. I think I think we met during the course of both of you. I met you, and I'm happy that you're still active, because this is a long-term issue, mm -hmm. and it's um, you know the greatest thing that would come out of it is that people get together and say, irrespective of our point of view, you know, we we will look at it together and critically. And I think over a period of time it'll happen. There's no point for scientific community to have dogmatic views. It just doesn't work. Um, activism is very important to bring to the notice of the government things at the ground level so that they become sensitive to it. Politics is another world where egos take over and sometimes they lose the wood for the trees. But the challenge for activists is to get their point of view across. We've, I've done that in India. I've done that with a lot of other people in other countries, and I, I hope that you are able to do it. So I wish you well on that count. Thank you very much. Uh, the time has come. Then once again, I wish I uh, like to express sincere thankfulness to today's 
uh, very in impressive and very detailed report of you. And today, there's uh, two or three uh, flyers of Anand's lecture series in Tokyo after this, at this afternoon and tonight and in Kyoto also. Uh, if you have any interest, please attend it. Thanks again, uh, Mr. Arnold Grover, and thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you.